So uh, I first wanted to start off just um, by acknowledging um, we're sort of in two places and maybe more than two today, but um, I wanted to acknowledge that um, Montreal is the unceded uh, territory of the uh, Ganya Gehaga people um, uh, and nation. And I also wanted to acknowledge uh, its role as a traditional gathering place for Anishinaabe, Huron, Wendat, and Abenaki nations. And also mention that the land uh, where I work and live is the unceded territory of the Ute peoples um, and also a place where Apache, uh, Arapaho, Comanche, and Cheyenne peoples have gathered. Um, so I want to start with that land acknowledgement um, by noting those and acknowledging those who've cared for this land through generations, as well as the displacement and erasure of Indigenous peoples and the need to recognize and work together to address settler colonialism and its legacies. Um, and I also want to thank um, Edi and Grea uh, for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you. And I would like to say that in French, but I'm a little nervous because <laughs> my French is so rusty. So, um, well, I'll just say, um, merci beaucoup uh, de m'inviter ici uh, pour uh, uh, parler avec vous aujourd'hui. So. Okay, so today I want to talk to you uh, about a book called The Right to be Cold um, and its relationship to climate ethics. And I'll start off um, with a little bit of background on climate ge ethics generally, and then I'll spend the central part of the talk talking, um, discussing the book and trying to give you a sense of why I think this book is really important. Um, some of you may have read it, um, uh, it was a candidate for a, like a CBC Canada Reads um, selections a few years ago, um, but I think it's a really valuable book both uh, for scholars in climate ethics and for people generally, and also I found it to be really pedagogically valuable um, for work with students. I taught it in a class called Contesting Climate Justice um, earlier this year. Okay. Let me see if we can get to the next slide. All right, so what do people owe one another in a climate changed world? This is clearly a question of ethics, but I think that the simplicity of the question belies the complexity underlying it. The ethics of global climate change encompasses a whole host of additional questions. For example, with respect to mitigation, how should nations divide responsibility for greenhouse gas emissions reductions? And on what basis? What role should current and historical contributions play in determining a fair distribution of mitigation burdens? And what role should uh, current capacity of various nations, financial, technological, or otherwise play? Are there other factors that should be considered? For example, if a poor nation currently has very low fossil fuel emissions per capita, is it reasonable, as many have argued, for that nation to postpone significant cuts in order to bring people out of severe poverty? With respect to adaptation, there's a similar set of questions. How can adaptation be designed to best meet the needs of those affected by climate change in different parts of the world? Who should decide what adaptation measures should be taken and how? And what role should citizen engagement play in adaptation? And what would just adaptation look like? And what is the role of wealthy and historically high emitting nations in paying uh, to help others adapt to climate change? We might also ask similar questions uh, in the realm of loss and damage, uh, where the impacts of climate change are unavoidable. How should loss and damage be addressed? How can the full scope of climate related losses be understood and considered when not all losses are easily measurable or commensurable in economic terms? How should moral, legal, and economic responsibility for loss and damage be determined and what responses to loss and damage would be appropriate and why? So as this list, uh, these are just sort of some of the ethical questions involved in the realm of climate change and you can see they're numerous. Um, I think the other thing that this um, list of questions illustrates is that there are not only philosophical questions but also institutional questions. So which entities are responsible for what? What laws or agreements could adequately hold various actors accountable for their contributions to climate change and so on? 
However, climate change involves actions, actors, and relationships at many levels, from individuals to communities to nations and beyond. And although the debates over adaptation policy or how to find, define mitigation may seem technical and at times inapproachable for non-specialists, the philosophical questions are deep and practically significant. What might a just transition away from fossil fuels look like and how might it be achieved? How can climate policies from global to local levels recognize and incorporate the diverse voices and perspectives of those affected by these policies? The way these questions are answered will affect the lives and livelihoods of present and future people across the world, as well as the ability for numerous other species to survive and thrive. So climate ethics matters. But I want to suggest um, in this talk that climate ethics is not only about climate. As a cross-cutting issue, climate change affects everything from individuals to ecosystems and communities to commodities. While some scholars have argued that climate change should be addressed in isolation, uh, Simon Caney, Kyle White, and others argue for a more integrated view. So as Caney explains, climate change and policies needed to combat climate change are inextricably connected with a series of other issues. Uh, more pointedly, philosopher and indigenous scholar activist Kyle White argues that justly addressing climate change requires attentions to, to the ongoing practices and legacies of colonialism. So White writes, in the absence of a concern for addressing colonialism, climate justice advocates do not really propose solutions to climate change that are much better for indigenous well-being than the proposed inaction of even the most strident climate deniers. Decolonization and anti-colonialism cannot be disaggregated from climate justice for, individ uh, for indigenous peoples. Now, I think, you know, this comparison between climate justice advocates and climate deniers may sound harsh to some. Um, but white and other scholars, I think, make a strong case for the claim that efforts to undertaken to address climate change can perpetuate or even exacerbate existing injustices tied to colonial displacement and domination. Now, what I wanna focus on here, however, is not this comparison between climate justice advocates who overlook colonialism and strident climate deniers, but instead on the claim that colonialism and climate justice for indigenous peoples are intertwined. And I think that even this more modest claim is likely to be controversial. And for those of us whose lives have been relatively insulated from the burdens of colonialism, it may even seem unintelligible. I want to suggest, however, um, that Sila Watt Cloutier's book, The Right to be Cold, makes this claim not only intelligible but compelling and in doing so offers some broader lessons for climate ethics. Um, so Watt Cloutier is uh, a Canadian Inuit woman and activist who has worked to improve education, health, and the environment for Inuit communities throughout the Arctic. She's also a Nobel Pri Peace Prize nominee, former chair of the um, Inuit Circumpolar Council. In 2005, with support of the ICC and on behalf of Inuit peoples uh, of the US and Canada, she submitted a petition to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights seeking relief from violations resulting from global warming caused by acts and emissions of the United States. And her work to situate and characterize climate change as an issue of human rights has been influential around the world. So the right to be cold uh, illustrates, oops, yeah, I'm gonna go to that in a second. The right to be cold illustrates the entanglement of history, family, community, ecology, and health, and challenges widespread views of the Arctic as uninhabited land occupied only by marine mammals and polar bears. In doing so, what, what Cloutier's work and consideration of the relationship between climate change and Inuit people in the Canadian Arctic more broadly brings into focus some of the critical challenges for contemporary climate ethics, offering important normative and methodological insights. So what the right to be cold does so beautifully in my view is to interject 
through a compelling narrative that links the personal, cultural, institutional, and political, a critical perspective into discussions of climate justice. And to make that narrative accessible to those who know little about climate change, the Arctic, human rights or Inuit peoples and their historic and contemporary relationships with the can Canadian government. Okay, so from here, uh, the paper proceeds in four parts. Um, so first I provide a kind of brief sketch of some challenges for climate ethics and climate justice. Second, I discuss in some detail Juan Cloutier's book, offering an overview and, and, and sharing uh, some of the passages and ideas that illustrate the way in which the narrative is developed and how the author draws on her own experience to give the reader a deeper understanding of what is at stake for her community. Um, next, I turn to some key themes in the book that are relevant to climate ethics. Um, and then I conclude um, by revisiting some of the challenges um, for climate ethics more broadly. Okay, so some challenges for uh, contemporary climate ethics and justice. Um, as I've already indicated or suggested, climate ethics poses philosophical, political, and practical challenges. I think from a philosophical pr perspective, um, pr top-down normative approaches to climate ethics um, have a number of sort of face a number of challenges. Um, they tend to focus on international distributive justice, or they have, uh, although I think that's changing, and on abstract general principles. And this poses some limitations in terms of uh, dealing with kind of contextual challenges. Um, so take, for example, uh, the pr principle of equal per capita emissions as a way of sort of distributing the burdens of mitigation fairly. Um, actually implementing um, that principle um, involves a number of, would involve a number of challenges. For example, like if, if sort of that principle were instantaneously put into effect, it would mean massive cuts in emissions for high emitting countries, um, while low em emitting um, countries would be allowed substantial increases. Um, so scholars have thought about um, the way in which these abstract principles connect to um, more specific contexts and, and then refine them, for example, through proposals like contraction and convergence, where um, high emitting nations sort of gradually reduce their emissions and low emitting nations are allowed uh, some degree of increase to converge to a sustainable level. Um, but nevertheless, there are still sort of, I think fundamental issues that, rate, that, are, that arise like with the implementation of um, mitigation on the ground. And this has come up uh, with respect to um, red, red plus, and the way that, uh, for example, communities around the world uh, experience the effects of um, decarbonization or tree planting initiatives um, on the ground. So there are some challenges for sort of implementing and making relevant these substantive normative approaches, um, particularly where those approaches uh, involve reliance on ideal theory. Um, so you might think then that it would be better to sort of focus on more inclusive participatory procedural approaches to climate justice um, rather than more abstract ones. But these approaches are really only reliable when the procedures themselves are reliable um, and when they're not overly uh, distorted by power dynamics. Um, but power dynamics have had a tremendously strong role in climate politics. Uh, there are lots of examples of this, um, but you know, one example at the international level includes the hijacking of the um, UNFCCC negotiations in Copenhagen, um, where China, South Africa, India, Brazil, and the U.S. brokered a last-minute deal uh, to save the agreement, undermining commitments to strong emissions targets and abandoning prior more ambitious goals. Um, and this kind of deal making is not new. It's something that's been going on for a long time. Um, and 
um, for example, as um, Yuba Sakona and others have written uh, in a 2002 editorial, um, equity seemed to be among the first casualties of the Kyoto process, where even the pretense of some form of equity between emissions reductions targets was quickly abandoned amidst the arbitrariness and global horse trading on which the agreement was ultimately based. Um, so there are clearly uh, challenges in developing both substantively and procedurally just approaches uh, to climate policy. And I think uh, um, scale is uh, a huge issue here because broad brush conceptions of justice can, as I've already sort of suggested, overlook micro or meso scales where decisions really matter. But in addition, I think what, there's a big risk um, that uh, concerns about the lack of consensus about climate ethics, climate justice, and key principles, and concerns about infeasibility uh, threaten the abandonment of ethics altogether and a kind of collapse into rail politics. Um, so I'm thinking there of the work of scholars like uh, Eric Posner and David Weisbach, who have really argued that ethics and justice have very little role to no role to play in climate policy, um, and that the kind of ruminations of philosophers are just these kind of disconnected, pie in the sky ideas that will founder on uh, disagreement and power dynamics and that if climate ethics is to be feasible, uh, it really needs to focus on uh, the achievement of agreements, uh, probably minimal agreements that are in the self-interest of all nations um, or at least of the powerful nations. Um, and in some cases they go so far as suggesting this might involve side payments uh, on the part of poorer nations uh, to wealthier nations in order to convince those wealthier nations to reduce their emissions. So to me, this is where we, you know, as a as a as somebody interested in climate ethics and climate justice, this is a place that we um, really would be best uh, not going. But that I think puts the burden on climate ethics and theories of climate justice and approaches to climate justice to address some of these challenges. Okay, so now I want to shift gears and talk a little bit about. Um, this book, uh, The Right to be Cold. Um, so as I've said, there's no simple solution to the challenges that I've outlined. I think general principles can constructively guide climate policy, but they alone are not enough. Ethical responses to climate change are context dependent and um, climate e equity will inevitably involve uh, political struggle. I think what's distinctive about the strategy described in the right to be cold is that it attempts to marry context sensitivity with broader human rights ideas. Um, and although the petition um, that I mentioned earlier, the human rights petition itself didn't succeed, at least not in a narrow sense, I think both this book and the right to be cold approach offer some important lessons for climate ethics. Okay, so um, what Cloutier's book um, is really a, a book that focuses, it's like a, it's a memoir um, and it focuses on her life and work from childhood through, um, you know, close to the present, uh, including her work with the Inuit Circumpolar Council to develop the right to be cold petition. Um, so, and one of the interesting things about the book is that the majority of the book is not uh, explicitly about climate change or climate ethics. Um, and I think one of the challenges of the book is to show how um, the, the story that uh, what Cloutier tells throughout is actually deeply relevant to climate ethics, even if it may not at first appear to be so. Um, so one of, the, one of the interesting anecdotes anecdotes I'll just mention is that when this book was a candidate for um, this CBC um, 
uh, Canada Reads Prize, one of the judges um, uh, dis, you know, argued against the book, um, saying that it was quite tedious, that you had to sort of wade through all of Wat Cloutier's life story uh, to finally get to the discussion of climate change. And for that reason, uh, the book should be disqualified. Um, so I want to I'm hoping that I can convince you um, that that judge's uh, uh, opinion uh, was limited in a certain way, and that the book itself has um, more value than than that assessment might suggest. So this is just a map uh, that shows uh, the pin is uh, at Kujuak, which is the the hometown. Uh, where Sila Wat Cloutier uh, grew up. And this is where the book begins. Okay. Um, so here's um, another uh, way of um, representing Kujuak uh, rather than in a map through a photo. Uh, and I want to say a little bit about uh, this place um, as, we, as we get started. Okay, and a little bit about Wat Cloutier herself. Um, and the book. So um, as I've already suggested, um, the book is a memoir. It talks about her life story. It doesn't set out to provide a philosophical theory of climate justice, but it does address climate in ethical terms. And it provides a rich account of how climate change intersects with the lives and livelihoods of Inuit people in the Canadian North, how climate change is a cultural and ethical issue that needs to be understood in relation to broader histories and contexts. And I think one of the also interesting things about this book is that the author doesn't describe herself as an environmental activist. Instead, instead she says that she came to be involved in, in environmental issues through her global work as an elected leader advocating for her community. Um, so Wat Cloutier was born in 1953 um, in uh, Old Fort Chimo, um, an old Hudson Bay Company trading post, um, which is also Kujuak. Um, Kujuak is the Inuktitut or Inuit language name for this place, um, meaning Great River. Um, and she initially lived in Old Fort Chimo, which was on one side of the river, but then later moved across the river to New Fort Chimo the site of a former World War II US Air Force base. Um, and New Fort Chimo became the center of the community in Kujuak as the services moved over there, the school was located there. Uh, when Wat Cloutier was young, um, there were just a few hundred people in New Fort Chimo and now there are over um, 2,000. So I wanted to share uh, a few words about how, um, of, of Wat Cloutier's own description of this place. She says, Kujuak sits just below tree line and the rolling hilly terrain is dotted with tamarack and blue spruce trees. During the short summer months, cloudberries, blueberries, arctic cranberries, and black crowberries grow among the green leaves and tundra. Fluffy white cotton grass and deep pink fireweed wave in the breeze and bluebells, green mosses and gray lichens spread out across the land. In the winter, the landscape is transformed into a brilliant vista of ice and snow that stretches under the vast expanse of the blue Arctic sky. So in the early, in the first chapter of the book, um, Wat Cloutier orients us to the land and the place and also introduces her family, her grandmother, her mother, her siblings, and her extended family. I think one important aspect of her family is that both her grandmother and mother um, met and had children with um, Kalanat or white people, European people of European descent. And in both cases, uh, her grandmother's case and her own case, um, those men left the community. Uh, so both her grandmother and mother uh, raised um, their children in the absence of their father. And Wakalitie talks about how her extended family, um, her mother and her grandmother in particular, kind of working together, helped create a supportive and safe environment for her as a child. 
Um, she notes that her mom was not especially kind of warm and uh, sort of cuddly, <laughs> um, but was incredibly uh, resilient and also uh, self-reliant and resourceful. Uh, so she talks in this chapter about her mother uh, pulling together the materials and working with, I think, an uncle to build her own house in old New, in New Fort Chimo. And then she also talks about her grandmother's role as a really nurturing presence in her life, um, describing her grandmother's gentle warmth and steady presence. Um, so in this chapter, she notes, I, uh, and this is a quote, I grew up in a world of safety. The home that my mother and grandmother created was a place of security, comfort, and peace. Um, also in this early part of the book, uh, she introduces some Inuit values. She talks about, and, and, and sort of character traits, uh, talking about Inuit people as calm, focused, and reflective. And she ties these traits to um, hunting and the patience and required and the appreciation and need for quiet uh, that's involved in hunting. Um, so another thing she discusses early in the book is how, um, how she learned as a child along with other girls and boys various important skills um, critical to cultural practices um, provisioning practices uh, for, for Inuit people. So she talks about learning to prepare food and make clothes from animals that uh, the community has hunted. Uh, for those skills were particularly imparted to girls. Um, and boys learning to make uh, hunting sleds and build uh, igloos. And all children, she notes, learn to fish from a very young age. And when I was looking actually for uh, pictures for um, this talk, I found a, a photo of a, uh, an Inuit woman uh, teaching her two-year-old to ice fish. So <laughs> this is uh, still an ongoing practice today. Another important um, piece that she describes is the um, role of the, the sled dogs as sort of part of the community. And this will come back um, later in the book uh, as well when she talks about how the community changes over time in part, uh, largely due to outside influences. So one of the ideas that's at the core of the book is really the importance of hunting and uh, country food or Inuit um, sort of Inuit foods for the sustenance, um, both sort of physical sustenance, but also communal and spiritual sustenance of, of the community. Um, so she describes how when hunters return from a hunt with a, a seal or caribou, the community comes together, gathers to share food. Um, she talks about uh, using this uh, ulu, this sort of traditional uh, curved knife, uh, to cut up the food. Um, and she talks about seal, whale, caribou, goose, duck, ptarmigan, and fish as being important to the diet of people in the community and, um, and how these foods are really critical because they provide um, important nutrients uh, and also enough sort of uh, richness and fats to keep people warm in, in the far north. Um, and she also notes that these foods are particularly important because of the limited availability of Southern foods and the expense of buying Southern foods. Um, she talks at one point about the cost of various Southern foods and how you know, a box of crackers um, might cost 10 or $15. Uh, Wakalatier also talks about how she grew up speaking in Uktutut, uh, the Inuit language at home, um, although she learned English in school. And school was a really kind of, uh, I don't know, an interesting crossroads uh, for Wakalatier because this was a place where sort of Southern ideas, Southern concepts, Southern literature, um, Southern games were introduced. Uh, she talks about growing up reading Dick and Jane books, 
and finding very little to relate to um, in in, in those in those books, which described a sort of world um, that was uh, fairly unfamiliar to her, but she's not entirely um, you know critical of, of of the role of of the schools, uh, and talks throughout the book about the importance of schooling and providing kind of structure and discipline, um, which she says kind of dovetails well um, with. Uh, sort of Inuit cultural values. She also begins to note throughout the book um, the extremely rapid changes that her community experiences over the course of the 20th century or the second half of the 20th century. When she is very young, there are no cars in the community. Um, by the time she's an adult, there are many. It's, uh, there are also shifts in from being a more nomadic hunting uh, population to a more settled uh, community that shifts from subsistence hunting to trapping and trading and is therefore more entangled with and more dependent on the South uh, for their economic livelihood. So she describes this as a shift to, and this is a quote, less hunting, less freedom, and less independence over time. Also uh, in the book, um, I think her educational experiences are really critical. Um, after her fourth year of grade school, she's told that she's been chosen to go south to school. Um, so she's uh, sent to Nova Scotia at the age of 10. Uh, to go to school and to live with a family in a very small town there um, called Blanche, where I think she says there are just about five families living in this little uh, little town. And she travels to another slightly larger town to actually go to school. Um, but she describes her feelings of isolation um, and disconnection from her culture and family upon um, leaving the Arctic and traveling to Nova Scotia. Um, she's forced to change the way she dresses and obviously um, isn't eating the same country food on which she's grown up. Um, and she describes as particularly distasteful the tumblers of milk that she's forced to drink uh, because she says up north they only had, you know, canned and powdered milk and they used it quite sparingly just for tea and um, not to drink in, in large, large quantities. Um, another very difficult aspect of her time in Nova Scotia was that her only conversations with her mother and family were through a phone system that worked via ham radio. So basically, it was like talking on a walkie talkie and everyone could hear the conversation. Um, she also, during this short time, she was only there for about a year, um, came home one day uh, to discover that the letters, uh, the, the correspondence that she'd been having um, by mail with her family, uh, she found these letters sprawled out on the dining room table. They were clearly being read by the family. Um, and then once the family realized that um, she was writing of her loneliness and homesickness and wanting to go back, they screened all her letters from then on. Uh, except for the one she was able to write in the nook to, to, to her grandmother. Um, so the experience in Nova Scotia was fairly, I think, traumatic uh, for Wat Cloutier. Fortunately, she was able to um, convey this when she went back home and uh, the following summer, and she was um, able to work with the Bureau or her family was able to work with the Bureau of Indian Affairs to um, relocate her to a different school, a residential school in Churchill, Manitoba, where she spent uh, about three years. And she describes that experience as largely positive, but it too disrupted connections to family, community, culture, and language. Um, and then after her time in Churchill, um, she was selected to move to Ottawa to finish her education uh, in high school. So she really, um, she describes uh, her educational experiences with um, 
with ambivalence, I guess I'd say. So both uh, valuing the education that she gets and the structure uh, she finds there, but also uh, recognizing how disruptive uh, the Southern education was to her connection with family, culture, and community. And she describes with particular, I think, uh, well, she describes particularly how difficult it was for her to lose chunks of her language uh, and going back to her community and, and sort of searching for words. But when she does return uh, at age 18, um, she actually uh, gets a job as a medical translator at a nursing station. And she does describe uh, the sort of struggle of uh, relearning her language, redeepening uh, her connection to the language, but um, she talks about um, continuing to persist and get others to help her with her words and, and ultimately notes that relearning Inuktitut gave her back her sense of, in her words, her sense of Inuit identity. It's also at this point though, um, when she's 18 and she's returned to her community that she just, she notices um, in a very vivid way, the significant changes to the community that have occurred during her time away. Um, so she notes a decline in health, um, the changes in housing, uh, a lot of people live in government provided houses with poor ventilation and um, mold uh, develops and people end up having respiratory problems. Um, there's an increase she notices in substance addictions, uh, increase in domestic violence, and she describes this as a result of community disruptions and the shift from hunting to fishing and tr um, to trapping and trading. Um, it's also the case that the community is, because of this shift, eating less country food and they're more dependent on the South and on um, institutions of various kinds, uh, sort of colonial institutions rather than um, institutions, traditional institutions. Uh, another really painful um, episode she describes, um, you know, one of the things she notices when she comes back to the community is that um, the sled dogs have been largely replaced by snowmobiles and um, she, she, won she wonders about what happened to the, to the dogs um, and reflects on, uh, in sort of later, you know, uh, hears stories and begins to understand for herself the history of um, the loss of the sled dogs, which involved in part um, the Canadian police uh, shooting many of the dogs due to concerns about um, concerns about the spread of disease or um, also, you know, they're wanting the dogs to be um, managed in certain ways, like to be chained rather than running free um, and shooting dogs that are running free. Um, um, but one of, the, one of the difficult, well, there are many difficult aspects of this episode, but one of the difficult things is that many times um, the dog owners, the Inuit dog owners, don't really know at all why their dogs are being shot. Um, and so um, there's really lack of communication. Um, and because the dogs are such an important part of the community, so central to uh, hunting, so central to the lives and livelihoods of, of these people, um, the loss of the dogs is extremely disruptive and traumatic. Um, and she ties this into um, the kinds of, um, I don't know, difficulties that the community is experiencing, um, decline in health, decline in sort of so positive social relations, mental health issues, and for the first time, suicide. Um, so one of the things that then happens, um, I'll just stay on this slide for now, is that um, what Claudia gets involved in many ways in the community. Um, she uh, 
gets involved in the school board, in the health board, and seeks to work to disrupt the patterns that are damaging the community. Um, and she talks about um, how her own experiences help to build resilience and perseverance um, and enabled her to become an effective advocate for her community in various settings, including as leader of the Canadian branch of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, as well as a leader in a regional organization, the Makovec Corporation, which is involved in education, economic development, and advocacy for the Inuit of Nunavik. This leads her into um, a campaign to address persistent organic pollutants in the Arctic. Um, and these pollutants um, uh, bioaccumulate in animals such as marine mammals and contaminate Inuit traditional foods. Uh, they, they pose, um, you know, although the communities are small, so it was difficult to do scientific studies to actually understand the effects, but um, they pose risks um, to children and to nursing mothers. And um, one of the challenges associated with these pollutants is um, they lead people to feel sort of like they have to make a choice between eating their traditional foods and avoiding contaminants. 80% of these pollutants um, in the Arctic, in the Canadian Arctic, come from outside of Canada. Um, and they're, you know, a further disruption to um, to really to country food, which is not just food; it's really central to community. Um, in her work to try and address uh, persistent organic pollutants at the international scale, Wakotia is very aware um, of the interconnectedness of this problem with um, things that are happening around the world, not just because the rest of the world is the source of the pollutants, but also because um, some of these pollutants like DDT are actually important in other communities for controlling malarial mosquitoes. So one of the things that she tries to do is build connections with and solidarity with uh, people in other parts of the world um, in order to find solutions um, that, uh, that take into account the needs of local communities. Throughout the book, um, and, and I guess I'll just one other thing to say about that is that, you know, throughout the book, the intergenerational um, dimensions are, are quite central. So um, Wakalitia is very concerned with um, children and the youth and how kind of uh, change of intergenerational trauma can be uh, broken. Another thing she's doing throughout the book is challenging kind of common representations of the Arctic. She in particular uh, picks on this advertising campaign from Coca-Cola that has polar bears and seals kind of cavorting together, throwing a ball to each other and enjoying Coke. Um, and here she says, um, that this is a highly unlikely scenario as one is actually lunch, not a playmate for the other. Um, but more broadly, um, I think she's concerned that um, it's not just these kinds of misrepresentations uh, that are problematic, but, but that the Arctic is generally portrayed um, as a place that is uh, that of, of ice, uh, ice and water and wildlife but not a place where people live. So she says, cruise ships and travel companies are selling tourists our wildlife and stunning landscapes. Um, but when the vast majority of people think of the Arctic, they still think of polar bears, not people. So she's trying to kind of uh, repopulate the Arctic in the minds of, of those of us who live in the South. At, at this point in the book, she also um, begins to talk about the impacts of climate change on, uh, on her people and on hunting in particular, as the changing snow conditions make it more difficult for hunters to travel across the snow. The ice conditions are changing and becoming more unstable and um, animals are moving, migrating in different times into different places. Um, and I think both through her work on the persistent organic pollutants and her work on, uh, you know, thinking about 
climate impacts, she recognizes that not all problems can be solved locally, um, that Arctic communities are entangled with the global community and solutions uh, need to involve that broader community. All right, so this finally brings us to the right to be cold, um, which, you know, interestingly is not um, the chapter that focuses on the petition. There's just one chapter called the right to be cold that focuses on this commit on this, um, this human rights petition. Um, but she, in collaboration with a number of Southern environmental groups, uh, develop a petition that's shared at the um, Montreal meeting of uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of Parties in uh, 2005, um, and then submitted, uh, actually, I think during that conference to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And she describes um, some aspects, important aspects of this, saying the well being of our environment is in itself a fundamental human right. Without a stable, safe climate, people cannot exercise their economic, social, or cultural rights. She also argues that a human rights based approach shows us that fundamental change is not just sound policy, but also an ethical imperative. Um, so I think. You know, one of the things about this um, petition is that it's not successful. Um, the petition's denied. They're given a hearing, um, but the petition never really goes anywhere. Um, nevertheless, I want to suggest that the petition uh, is, even if not successful in a narrow sense, is successful um, in a broader sense. And in particular, successful because it uh, introduces you know, human rights as a potential frame for thinking about climate harms. And because it inspires others in other parts of the world um, to, um, to adopt that approach. And also because the petition itself is a way of conveying and communicating many of the ideas that I've just explained in the book, how um, climate change is not just an economic issue um, for these people. It's not uh, just, uh, you know, an issue, an abstract issue, and it's not an issue that can be isolated uh, from from history, uh, the histories that Inuit people have experienced and their relations uh, with um, with um, those in the South and with uh, the governments that have affected them through uh, colonial practices. All right, so um, there are a number of key themes in the book. I think many of these, I think, are probably already visible to you from the description that I've given. Um, but the importance of context, narrative, meaning, and value come out as, as central. Um, I think the reason that Wat Cotier spends so much time on her story is because she thinks that that broad story of change over time, the story of the connections between hunting, food, community, um, culture, relationships, and health are all really critical. Um, re relationality is another key theme and relational values. She talks about um, extended family as playing a key role um, in social support. She talks about the dogs as being sort of part of the community and the relations within the community um, and of food as a kind of important relational connection among people. Um, health is also a really important theme where health is construed, I think, arguably more broadly um, than in terms of just physical metrics, but involves um, thinking about the structure of the community, the institutions that support it, the nature of education, the kinds of foods that are available, all those contribute broadly to health. Um, and she talks about climate change as one challenge among many, sort of yet another, um, another challenge on top of uh, many prior challenges um, that have precipitated rapid change and have required adaptation. Um, despite focusing on challenges, she emphasizes the importance of persistence, resilience, uh, and the idea of kind of collective continuance, which I take from Kyle White. Um, 
a, a sort of shared social capacity to adapt um, to new circumstances over time. And then throughout the book, and I think this is one of the things that makes it fairly accessible to, um, to readers um, outside of the Arctic is that she really emphasizes interconnectedness and shared humanity and invites the reader um, sort of into the conversation and into the dialogue. Um, and she also, despite all the challenges she faces, despite the political obstacles, um, she remains, she retains kind of a deep faith in humanity, which I think um, is also, um, has a kind of invitational quality in relation to the reader. Um, so I think that's, those are some of the reasons why the book works. Um, she is very frank and open. It's, it's easy to empathize with her experiences. And she also tells the story in a way that shows that um, she herself had to kind of put the pieces of the story together over the course of her life. Um, I've also suggested, I think the petition, uh, even though it wasn't formally successful, I think the petition worked in a way. And I think it worked in part because it functions uh, in the role of what Michael Walter calls a kind of role of a connected critic. It speaks in a language um, that uh, those outside of the Arctic can understand this language of human rights. And I think um, Wakatia generally has kind of a role in serving as a translator uh, between her community and Inuit communities broadly in the circumpolar north and other communities throughout the world. Um, and I also think the book is really effective and the petition in, uh, as she says, moving the discussion out of the realm of dry economic and technical debate, taking the path of principles, showing us that fundamental change is not just sound policy, but also an ethical imperative, refocusing the debate on humanity rather than solely on economics. Okay, so I wanna circle back and uh, wrap up by, by talking briefly about uh, some of the implications of this book for climate ethics. Um, and I, so context matters. Um, I think it's clear that uh, in order to untangle um, the kinds of challenges uh, that Wakatier describes her community experiencing, it's really critical to understand uh, the social context, the historical context, and the way in which climate change can't easily be understood sort of in isolation as some kind of novel, um, novel challenge to the community. Um, Wakatier, um, I think, shows how climate change is sort of another layer of challenge, um, which is consonant also with um, Kyle White's understanding of climate change as sort of another um, sort of another chapter in, in the history of colonialism and colonial impacts on indigenous communities. Scale also matters. I mean, I think um, the kinds of solutions or the kinds of responses that are appropriate need to take into account um, the needs of the community and, and the particulars uh, at um, within the Arctic. Um, and then history matters. So um, we're in the realm of non-ideal theory. There's already been <laughs> sort of non-compliance with sort of fundamental principles of justice. Um, so that history needs to be taken into account in thinking through how best to move forward. I would also suggest that um, Wakotier's story indicates that justice requires recognition in a normative sense. Um, and here, um, I like Nancy Fraser's conception of recognition as participatory parity, um, as, as um, providing space um, for all voices to be heard and for um, recognition, not just as some kind of abstract fundamental equality, but uh, in terms of a kind of robust respect for difference. Um, and in this, listening is really critical. Um, so 
I think that's just enough about that. Um, but um, I, I think the book as a whole suggests that there's a need for scalable approaches to climate ethics and climate justice and attention to interconnections. I think one thing the book um, suggests is that although context matters and although the local needs to be um, very central in, in, in determining ethical responses for climate to climate change, not all problems can be solved within the community um, because many communities, including Arctic communities, but not limited to them, are strongly influenced by significant forces from outside. The POPs, the persistent organic pollution problem, can't be solved solely within the community. Climate change can't be solved solely within the community. So um, ultimately, I think the book makes a very powerful argument that climate change and colonialism are intertwined and that an ethical response to climate change is not just a matter of saving sea ice, but of repairing relations, attending to historical injustices and current context and enabling more equitable distributions of power. So I'll stop there and just um, be happy to take any questions that you 